or so. Uh, so before I begin my slides, I would like to say that I am um, dispensing with a lot of the uh, basics of what games are, because I am going with a, a bit of the assumption that I am, uh, you know, uh, speaking to a, a group of people that knows what games are, not um, not a, a, a teacher or a designer new to games. So I'm, I'm dispensing with, uh, you know, parts of games and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm just right now, as I'm talking, I am uh, setting up the screen share. Hoping this works. Oh, here we go. Let's see. That is my son screaming in the background. Okay, so I should be sharing my screen. And if that's the case, I will uh, ask Sue to type, uh, I can see you in the chat. <laughs> no pressure. All right, look at that, amazing. So what you're seeing here is the new MacBook Pro. Um, oh, oh yeah, here we go. So here we go, game-based learning, um, how a group of ed tech teachers make it work. Uh, my name is Matthew Farber. I am a, a doctor of educational technology leadership. Um, I'm a teacher. I am a, a professor as well, assistant professor, as well as a um, Brain Pop certified educator, which you can see there. I'm also part of the iCivics teacher network and I'm also part of um, the, uh, well, I'd like to call it the tribe. That's uh, Peggy's word for it, and I'm going to get a little bit deeper into that in a second. So uh, this is my book's newest edition, Gamify Your Classroom, A Field Guide to Game-Based Learning. Um, it is a game-based learning book. Uh, there is a chapter on gamification. Uh, in general, it's mostly game-based learning. Uh, how games are used in the classroom, but as well as a survey of the field of game-based learning. Uh, in this book, I interview about 70 different people. So it's a full update from the uh, 2014 edition. Uh, it's also about 100 pages longer. And the uh, book features um, interviews with many, many experts in the field. And Greg Tapo from USA Today, the uh, education writer, was nice enough to write the forward for this book. Speaking of Greg Tapo, there he is in the top center. He, this is at the ISTE conference last year, um, and I was on a panel with uh, Dr. Benjamin Stokes, who's one of the co-founders of Games for Change, and uh, Louise Dubay, who is on the other side there. And uh, this is, she's the executive director of iCivics. And uh, the bottom is from Games for Change, and this is a panel I was on last year on computer science for all. Um, I was excited about this panel because I am a teacher. <laughs> uh, Games for Change has a lot of people in the game industry. Um, they don't always have a lot of teachers on panels, and they've really started to open that up in the last couple of years. So I was excited to represent classroom teachers there, uh, as well as the fact that coding um, really works well when it's about self-expression and not merely about uh, solving puzzles because that can get kind of boring fast. This is a blog post I wrote uh, for the Sesame Workshop, the Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop, about just that, how um, coding can, should really be about self-expression. Um, it's just another digital media to express oneself just like you would, um, you know, writing a book or um, making a podcast, right? Um, and uh, to students, it gets quite, kind of old to keep doing codes, um, puzzles over and over. Getting a lot of alerts here from Melissa in and out. <laughs> Hope everything's okay. So um, why am I talking about coding right now and uh, self-expression? Well, 
Uh, one of the people I interview in my uh, upcoming book is Barry Fishman, who's a, a professor at the University of Michigan. And uh, we, we spoke about what makes things gameful. Why, do, why would somebody want to play something over and over again? Uh, and uh, he, we talked for a while about school as a, uh, as, as a puzzle. So a puzzle, as Jesse Shell defines, who's a, a game designer, who's, for those in the uninitiated, the uh, founder of Shell Games from uh, Pittsburgh, he defines puzzles as fun problems. Uh, once you figure out the solution to a problem, puzzles can get pretty boring fast. And if you look at school as a puzzle and not a game, it gets boring fast. But some kids, of course, are good at school. They're good at textbooks and worksheets. Um, but most students uh, want the agency. Uh, they want to control what is, um, you know, what their learning is, right? Uh, they want voice and choice in their learning. And, uh, you know, coding is just another piece of that. Uh, so this is a group of us at the White House last December. Um, and these are many people um, who I've also spoken with after I've moved my dissertation to book form, which is a lot more readable than dissertation, of course. Uh, this is the Games for Learning Working Group. Uh, we uh, met in Washington, D.C., and we meet um, a few times a year at uh, Games for Change conference as well. Uh, they're one of the um, key organizers here. So today we're going to be talking about how experts, uh, how expert educators, oh, typo, of course, how are expert educators using games in their classrooms to give students agency while also teaching 21st century skills of empathy, systems thinking, and design thinking. Uh, what I did in my uh, research was first I went through the literature of what, exi what already exists as far as how teachers use games in their classroom. I use the theoretical framework of Vygotsky, uh, where um, play brings children or, and adults to the zone of proximal development. Uh, play creates conditions of learning. And uh, Marie, Maria Montessori as well. Uh, how, um, and I'm going to circle back to this as well. <clears throat> so, my initial research was a case study ethnography into three different classrooms. I used grounded theory, so I, I took a lot of notes. Um, basically, that, that part remains intact from my dissertation to the upcoming book in that it's like a fly in the wall of being inside three different expert classrooms. These were my dissertation participants, uh, Steve Isaacs, Paul DeVarsi, that's me with a Doctor Who shirt, and Peggy is on my other side. Uh, this is at the Games in Education conference. And um, I was pretty fortunate that at the time, uh, these three were three of the four most recent keynote speakers. So it made justifying uh, them as experts pretty easy because Games in Education did the legwork for me by selecting keynotes. I just needed to uh, get their process. And uh, the fourth keynote was Lee Sheldon, who wrote the multiplayer classroom, uh, but he is a college professor, so he was excluded, unfortunately. But it'll be awesome to see how he actually teaches um, to be in his classroom. Uh, one of the great things about writing a dissertation is um, observing another teacher in action. That's not something teachers get a lot of chances to do. A lot of times teaching can be a bit of an isolation, um, which is not the way teaching really should be. Teaching is a design science, and designers share. They share openly, they share best practices, they have post-mortems afterwards, what worked, what didn't work, and uh, that's, that's why I think um, this uh, niche of teachers, especially the ones that keep going to serious play, are ones that like conferences, um, because you get to do just that. It's a, it's a true idea forum. So uh, here's some tweets about uh, the three of them documenting their uh, speaking at the conference. And I'm gonna play a little clip here. This is the commercial from 2015.
So the uh, Games and Education um, Symposium is a uh, is is run by many organizations, but it was spun off by First Playable Productions in upstate New York, and it takes place every year, and it's a teacher professional development conference. It's a little bit different than Serious Play, uh, and it's a little bit different than Games for Change, and um, you know other other conferences out there in that it is more of a professional development conference um, as uh, for classroom teachers as opposed to, you know, um, teachers in general. I don't know how I get this message. How do I do that? Well, here's the tribe as a community of practice. I'm going to, um, can I exit out of here just to check? A message. Yes. <laughs> so here's the tribe as a community of practice. Um, the tribe, and there are many tribes out there, and certainly uh, the, the the name is used in many different communities of practice. Um, I do want to make sure I'm still sharing my screen now. Yes, okay. <clears throat> so uh, at this table is almost everybody I could think of that is highly involved in game-based learning. Uh, but there are more now, thanks to attendees of the conferences who are mentored by many of the people at this table, as well as Minecraft, uh, Minecraft has been terrific in onboarding teachers who can uh, use games in all sorts of different settings. So for my data collection, I visited the three schools you see here. And actually, most recently, I was back at the third school uh, for a webinar um, last uh, two weeks ago I, with uh, Steve Isaacs at his school. So this is Peggy's classroom. Um, I think it looks a little bit different now, but she's got uh, Yogi Bows there, if I'm pronouncing that right, which are awesome beanbag chairs for kids. Uh, there are students on their computers. Uh, the door is shut. She has a um, uh, very uh, focused group of students. Uh, they're very excited to be there. Uh, well, I should say, as a classroom teacher, I've taken a lot from these experiences. So every time I'm in a classroom, embedded in a classroom, running research, and then I go back to my classroom, it affects how I teach. <laughs> so, you know, my classroom has become, uh, I don't have pictures here, but when you enter into Peggy's room, there are signs, you know, like um, testing with a, with a circle and a line through it, right? Um, it's, you know, it's almost like uh, the Mac group when uh, Apple started, uh, you know, creating a Mac, and Steve Jobs and his team were in another building with their pirate flag up. So that's, uh, that's kind of the vibe uh, in Peggy's room, and I have really adopted that into my classroom as well, um, because my students uh, in seventh grade social studies and sixth grade social studies, uh, they learn very fast. They use games and projects, and um, they, um, they know it's different than all of the other classes. Um, in, and not just because they're playing games. Uh, that's just one piece of it. So Peggy uses the World of Warcraft in school model, which um, I really was able to go deeper in my book. Um, it's going to be called Game-Based Learning in Action. And uh, she used a, a curriculum here called uh, WOW in School, A Hero's Journey. Uh, which was created by uh, Craig Lawson and Lucas uh, Gillespie. Uh, I interviewed Lucas in this book also to learn the entire uh, origin story. I want to know the origin story of everything, actually. <laughs> um, the origin story of this, how, how this even became um, World of Warcraft, the hero's journey, which is really about World of Warcraft. So it's the student's hero's journey using their avatar in the game, as well as their um, the student's journey as uh, an adolescent, as a hero in their own lives, as well as, uh, you know, in uh, Bilbo Baggins in The Hobbit. 
So you've got you know multiple um, overlapping versions of the hero's journey there. And it's interesting in the world of Warcraft because it is a MMO, a massive multiplayer online game, and there are many heroes, but you know you are unique in the journey that you are taking. Yeah, that alert. I also interviewed, um, I should say, uh, Lucas to learn more about how he put those quests online using something called 3D Game Lab. And I also interviewed Chris Haskell, who um, is one of the founders of 3D Game Lab, which is this web-based tool where students can have self-directed learning and decide which quest they want to learn about. The other class I went to was up in uh, Toronto, Paul DeVarsi's class. Uh, he teaches with, um, with Gone Home, which is a um, game that is an uh, interactive storytelling game. Uh, you are Katie, um, and you return to your house, and you, uh, Katie Greenbrier, um, and Katie Greenbrier comes home, and this is an all-boys school, mind you. So they're 12th grade um, literature students, English literature, and uh, they are taking on the role of Katie Greenbrier, and they have to explore this house and learn the whereabouts of the family. And uh, the game is very open, it's very story-based. Um, and uh, again, what's interesting here is that uh, how Paul rolls out the game, how he frames it to the students, how he talks about how his connection with the designer. Uh, Peggy also does that. She talks about the uh, people that send her games to play test and, you know, Membeam was one last year. Uh, and, um, uh, just like Peggy does, which I, I didn't mention, but um, Paul and Peggy, as well as the next participant, uh, create their own assessments. So Peggy uses Google Docs. I do that as well. Uh, and um, Paul here has a chart, and he puts this document on Haiku, which is another web-based uh, tool. And um, another, so the interesting thing here is that even when you're using an educational game, these expert teachers aren't using any dashboards or backend features. They're not looking at badges. They're not doing uh, anything that actually is pulled from an educational game. Uh, I saw very few educational games or games created or intended to teach a concept. I saw a lot of games used as digital humanities, games that are much deeper, richer experiences, uh, the same way a novel will be a rich experience. The same way you wouldn't necessarily just use a phonics book to teach reading, you would use actual books to teach reading, and then maybe augment it here and there with some skill reinforcement with a phonics book. Uh, Peggy does that using grain pop videos or flash lessons, stopping in the middle, bringing everybody to circle, and discussing a con concept um, before students go back to their individual work. And uh, that the reason why is, well, they're really good teachers, right? Uh, teachers already know how to do these sorts of things. Good teachers know how to create assessments, to create a nice graphic organizer here like Paul created for students to complete. Uh, and this is a little clip here. I'm not going to play the whole thing, but it's a little clip of Gone Home. So the game is an interactive story game. I actually had a conversation recently with a game designer about even if this is a game, there's a lot of conversation. Is this a game? Is this not a game? Uh, because, you know, you're, you're interacting with the environment, but what you do in the environment has no effect on the environment. Uh, so if you open a refrigerator or read a note or listen to an audio cassette, it doesn't actually affect the environment the way uh, most games have that uh, system, that interconnected system where there, there's a consequence to your causes, but it's a story-based game. And uh, as Jim G remarked, uh, the, um, 
you know, the uh, academic um, James Paul G. Specifically on Gone Home, really, who cares, right? What you're looking for are meaningful interactions. Uh, players tell these stories in their head. Uh, and, you know, you know in, in, in that way, books are interactive, too, because, you know, you're interacting with the material, right? Uh, so this is really important because it's another new digital media way to analyze and deep read a game. The uh, next person that I uh, visited in the classroom was Steve Isaacs, and I was in his classroom just again, like I said, two weeks ago uh, on a webinar we did for common sense education. And uh, in his class, students do all sorts of things. Uh, they make games. He has a computer technology class. Uh, I failed to mention Peggy is a humanities teacher. Paul, is a, uh, which I did mention, is an uh, English literature teacher. And Steve teaches video game design and development. Uh, but he teaches it under a framework of learning the uh, iter iterative design cycle, which is design thinking. Students make and create in his class. Um, and Steve does something in his class called 20% time. He does 20% Tuesday. And I lifted that from him with permission. Um, I, mine is on Wednesday. And it is my student's favorite day. 20% um, time is when students get 20% of the week or one of the five periods to follow a passion project, to create their own project and to see it to completion. And um, uh, it's also sometimes called genius hour. Uh, to me, this is the ultimate in gamification. Uh, there's no points, there's no badges. There's no leaderboard. To me, 20% time is gamification, and that's that. Students are completely self-directed. Uh, basically, students propose a project. It could be like a Shark Tank type of thing, like the TV show. Um, Steve's class, they were making games. They were publishing games. You could see in the bottom there, one student was putting a project on uh, Donors Choose. And um, that's their project, and they work on it every um, one day per week. And um, it's very meaningful because the students design it and they create it and they see it to fruition. Uh, in my class, I use the same open-ended questions that Steve uses because I asked him and he shares it right along. Um, and Peggy and Paul do the same thing. They uh, blog frequently about what goes on in their classrooms, which is just terrific because it helps bring more people who want to just dip their toes in game-based learning to go even further and deeper. Uh, to me, I thought 20% time would be very unstructured, kids just doing anything. But after I saw Steve's class, there was a tremendous amount of structure. There's uh, prompts they have to answer uh, before leaving the classroom, any aha moments they had, anything like that. And, uh, you know, my students uh, on Teacher Appreciation Week, every card a student wrote to me all mentioned 20% time. And I really feel like, you know, a little bad because... I'm the only class that does 20% time. So it's like they leave my class, they come in during lunch, they don't want to go to the bathroom during class. They just linger around and they want to continue on projects. Parents remark to me, well, there's a lot of homework in your class. And I, I tell them, there's almost no homework in my class unless you count a brain pop video or something. It's mostly these 20% time projects because they're so driven to, to create and to make. Uh, Steve's also since then worked a lot with Minecraft as a mentor. And Steve is, in many ways, the um, steward of this community of practice. So this is in my forthcoming book, Game-Based Learning in Action, How an Expert Affinity Group Teaches with Games. Uh, James Paul G. wrote the forward because, well, you know, he is the person that came up with the concept of an affinity space. Uh, this is a group of people, and it's not necessarily educational technology. Uh, he's remarked it could be people who are Catholic. They could be people who like um, knitting, right? They get together in this affinity group. And that's what this group of game-based learning teachers is, including myself, which I did not put in my dissertation, but I was able to in the book because you don't have to defend the book the same way. Uh, I also expanded the scope of my book, including almost all the teachers in the tribe that I can get a hold of. Uh, so here we have Zach Gilbert, who is a teacher in Illinois who teaches with all sorts of different games as well as projects like Civilization. And uh, the um, Minecraft-looking fellow next to him is Mark Rundle, who's a teacher in New Jersey, who also teaches, of course, with Minecraft as well as many other games. And we all share from each other. So just like I brought 20% time into my classroom, um, Mark 
teaches with a card game called One Night Ultimate Werewolf, or I think just Ultimate Werewolf in the version he uses with his fifth graders. So we all share ideas and games and strategies with one another. Um, the tribe, by the way, the best I can determine comes from Ken Robinson. Uh, he has a book called The Element, and there is a chapter called um, Finding Your Tribe. And um, I believe, uh, or I'd like to credit Peggy with the one for um, keeping that name um, as the tribe, because there are tribes of teachers and tribes of people who are interest driven. But um, for purposes of this book, I call it the tribe. Uh, so speaking of onboarding new members, this is Glenn Irvin. He teaches his class in, in 12th grade Spanish entirely in Minecraft. And he really leans on us as a community of practice. Um, Chris Haskell, who's a um, professor of educational technology at Boise State University. Um, Glenn was in uh, Chris's class online. Uh, Glenn suggested that, um, I'm sorry, Chris suggested that Glenn speak at Games in Education in uh, Troy, New York last summer, which he did. Um, and Glenn's since been at Mind Fair, which is a big um, Minecraft festival that uh, Steve Isaacs co-produces. And uh, Glenn was just in Texas for that. And uh, it's just amazing how he puts all of his lesson plans online and he creates this e-commerce world where students have to um, build this community and sell things and buy things from one another and only speak in Spanish. And it's just accelerated their learning and their uh, desire and agency to learn um, just so much that, um, you know, it's, it's very exciting that just see that see that difference. Uh, and we are truly global as the tribe. So this is Tobias. Um, he's gained international news uh, when he started teaching religion and ethics using choices in the uh, game, The Walking Dead. And what's amazing is he takes a tool like Kahoot, which some teachers use really well to, um, to introduce new content in something called Blind Kahoots, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, you don't know any of the content until you play the game, and then you learn it. It's a playful, direct instruction at the times you might want to do that. But what uh, he uses it for is uh, having students um, decide these choices. So they have this collective idea that they're making these choices. And uh, I recently interviewed Tobias a second time uh, for a paper that I am writing on empathy in games for UNESCO, and uh, he remarked how how students almost always have empathy for Clementine, the girl with the baseball cap. You play as Lee, but you have empathy for the girl under your care, which is where a lot of the literature is, that in games, empathy is not for who you're playing as. It's like virtual reality is empathy is not who you are. In life, you're not empathizing for yourself. By definition, you're empathizing for somebody else. And in this particular game, you're empathizing for Clementine. Again, Paul DeVarsi does a lot more than <laughs> teach with um, Gone Home. He also creates alt uh, ARGs, alternate reality games. And here he is as the big nurse from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, where he turns his school into the asylum in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. How exciting is that? Uh, even more people in the tribe, and again, we all see each other at conferences all the time. So we've got Bron Stuckey here, who is an expert of communities of practice. And, um, you know, she was my go-to person just to talk about, you know, where the tribe is. Um, in, in my upcoming book, I was able to speak to her about uh, her experience at, with Quest Atlantis, Quest Atl Atlantis, hard to say for some reason, <laughs> with Sasha Barab, which is a, a video game from about 10 years ago, which created this community of practice of teachers who used it. And um, she also um, shared where we are now as communities of practice. Uh, in my book, I also speak with uh, Mino Rami, who is uh, the community of practice uh, or the community manager for Minecraft uh, Education Edition. So it's sort of then to now. And uh, Ron also helped advise Microsoft on those communities. Uh, next to 
her is, um, I was putting the slide together. I was like, this is the Brady Bunch slide. <laughs> uh, next to her is uh, Jim Pike, who teaches math in Minecraft. Um, he does a lot of innovative things and also science in Minecraft. Uh, next to him is John Fallon, who also teaches with alternate reality games in the classroom. He does uh, lessons the same as Paul. They borrow. He also teaches Gone Home that way. And um, this spring, he took the game Her Story, which is a series of uh, video clips of a murder suspect. And he uses that to teach a literary device with his students in class. And it's uh, amazing to hear how he adapts games uh, that are commercial into his classroom. Uh, the same as many others that I've spoke with here in this picture. Um, below, below him, with the uh, monkey on him, is Dan Sercio, a teacher from New Jersey, uh, who um, presented at Games and Education last year, and uh, he used one of the games I presented at, uh, again, One Night Ultimate Werewolf. So, uh, and that's what I presented at Serious Play also last year. So it's uh, interesting to see how teachers attend conferences, socialize on social media like Twitter, uh, as well as um, adopt and use the uh, games that they see others um, implement. And then um, circling back in that rounds picture is uh, Alex Husoy, who is also from Norway. He works with Tobias and he co-delivers um, Gone Home at the same time Paul DeVarsi does. Here's a clip from Jim Pike students. He created the cell games to teach um, parts of cells. Students made cell, uh, cell games. They use level design. So each part of the cell goes from more difficult to the boss level. And you go through the cell, and I'm going to just play a clip. It's created by one of his students. So I'm going to pause it there. Um, really, what more could you possibly want from a student as an assessment, right? You've got the, uh, the game. He's recorded the game, uh, screencasting it. He's publishing it online. He's sharing it. He's got so much content in there. He created a game out of it too, right? Um, you know, you have to put on your Elytra suit, which is uh, wings, and you have to fly through the cell membrane. Um, so again, here's an example of a commercial game being adopted into the classroom. Uh, my research shows that all the teachers I just showed in those previous slides, um, as well as teachers in my dissertation, as well as myself as a practitioner, um, there's uh, three different ways you use games. Uh, there are, um, there's wholesale using the game right out of the box, which occasionally happens, like uh, iCivics games, which are created by filament games, like Win the White House. Those are terrific, right out of the box. Um, Dragon Box, they teach algebra, terrific. But there are so few games that are really actually good. So expert teachers, they adapt games or they appropriate games, or what Chris Haskell calls uh, contextual, re, I'm sorry, uh, contextual transposition of games. Uh, so he explained how, he, how students may take a game or a teacher might take a game like Kerbal Space, which is a rocket launching game, and instead of using it in a classroom to teach STEM skills, they'll use it in a classroom to teach about the Cold War. And you'll have two versions of the game, a uh, screen up in the middle of the classroom, and then each student gets a role, like the spy, 
or the, um, the, the press or the scientist, and they have to see who can get the rocket to the moon first. And that's an example of contextual transposition, which is a type of uh, appropriation of an existing game to meet the purposes or needs of the teacher. Uh, some more, so I have another picture of Peggy because why not, she's here. Uh, in the bow tie is A.J. Webster, who is a teacher in California. Um, and uh, below him is uh, Marian Malmstrom, or No Clue Kid. And then next to her is Lucas Gillespie, who co-authored the World of Warcraft curriculum. So A.J., the person in the bow tie, last year he used this game called Flux which is a card game. Uh, he demonstrated this at a workshop at Games and Education. And uh, he did this with Christy Dunham, who is, uh, I'm sorry, Christy Durham, rather, who is uh, one of his um, co-teachers, or one of his fellow colleague teachers, I should say, out at the uh, Sycamore School in Malibu, California. Uh, prior to Sycamore Schools, AJ worked at Playmaker School, which is a short-lived um, school in Los Angeles, uh, which used games and maker spaces at uh, fifth grade level, I believe. So here he takes Flux, which is a commercial car game, and he adapts it to the classroom. So students play the game, just like students might play Minecraft in Steve's class or World of Warcraft in Peggy's class. And then they do something else with that experience. So you have a shared experience. So in this case, the game is very much like a field trip. Games are used as experiences. Uh, games aren't used as, you know, to teach, I don't know, one single concept like, uh, you know, uh, linear algebra. Uh, instead, games are taught to uh, be shared experiences for students. And I use Flux in my classroom, I should say. Uh, I also have used it at um, Game Jams. This is one at the New York Public Library where a student is using it to create their own version of the game, changing out the cards, uh, where you have to have matches of cards and different goals change all the time. Uh, this is about immigrant um, voices and local stories. But there are many versions of Flux. So one interesting thing that AJ pointed out is that because there are many versions of Flux, and anytime you see um, a game that has many versions, well, that means that's a nice indicator that you yourself can bring it to your classroom and have students make one based on content. And uh, this is what I did. I had students make their own version of Flux about Asian cultures. And immediately students start to embody game mechanics. Uh, so one, one girl raised her hand and said, can I make a uh, card for the Great Wall of China? And if I put that card down, other players cannot take my cards? Sure, of course you can, right? Um, and here, again, students really catch on as soon as they play the game, uh, different creative ways that they can make their own versions of games. Uh, and you know, here's an example of a modded version that uh, AJ and Christy shared, uh, where somebody made one based on, obviously, the Wizard of Oz. So lessons learned from all of this. Uh, expert teachers who use games, they engage in game-based learning affinity groups the tribe, uh, as well as uh, overlapping groups. So Steve Isaacs also works with, uh, or I don't know if I hate to say the word work, because it doesn't seem like work, uh, with many teachers who are Minecraft educators. And uh, they've used hashtags like um, GBL Alliance. So, um, you know, I, I, I work with teachers who are also in, uh, involved in maker spaces, um, like uh, Colleen Graves or, uh, Jackie Gerstein, I just saw pop in. So, you know, you, you've got overlapping tribes, right? Overlapping affinity groups. But the tribe is a community of practice with social affiliation. Uh, they discover games and play games together. They share student work together. Um, there is very little uh, perception of risk. Uh, it doesn't seem odd at all to me if I use a, uh, uh, a AAA video game in my classroom because I don't need to ask other teachers next door what they think. I mean, I do, of course, but uh, if something goes wrong, uh, I can always just, you know, send a quick direct message to uh, Steve, let's say, and um, ask him, you know, what do you think? What, what, 
how, or, or is the server down? You know, who else am I going to ask, right? So it's really helpful to have this network of people to help. Uh, this group by social affiliation also plays video games and board games. In a community of practice, we are practitioners. We actually do what we, uh, what we, we practice, what we preach, right? Um, there is uh, multiple, or I should say dual leadership styles. Those in the tribe here, these teachers I talked about, are transformational leaders outside of the classroom. These are teachers that all speak and keynote at conferences all over the world. Yet in their classroom, they're not transformational leaders. In their classroom, they take on a servant leadership role, which is where you lead from behind, like a Sherpa in your classroom, leading your students from behind. And you don't see this too often, this duality of leadership. Uh, in that case, teachers have their own agency. So the, the teaching with games is in itself gameful. It's fun to do because you take on different roles as the teacher, not just the sage on the stage. They use games as a focal point of instruction, um, as opposed to um, ed tech, like you would not just teach um, how to use GarageBand to make a power, uh, podcast, you would teach why podcasts, right? Digital remix and audio remix and sharing. Uh, and you might want to use Audacity or you might want to use GarageBand. But with games in the classroom, games are like novels. Uh, they can be used as the center point of instruction. Uh, so it's a little different than standard ed tech where you probably wouldn't want to do that. Uh, Gone Home is very much the centerpiece of instruction. The Walking Dead is very much the centerpiece of instruction. It's a model for students then to, to use and <clears throat> to learn about. Uh, they also adapt and appropriate different games in the classroom uh, for educational purposes. And um, they seek games for, with, that have playful affordances, uh, games that invite play, games that invite self-determination theory, in, in, in particular autonomy, uh, they value student interests and passions. Uh, they apply rhetorics of play into the classroom. They almost always use qualitative assessments, uh, which means they almost always create open-ended questions. And um, they also put, they don't design lesson plan, they don't write lesson plans in traditional senses. They are themselves designing meaningful experiences for their students, which is also very exciting. And another thing is, uh, it's not just publishing online. Uh, these teachers engage their students in their own passions and their own communities of practice. Uh, they apply this play theory where in play with games, you know, you can't learn. You don't, you don't get to become a master of something until you play with the content. And just some more Vygotsky pictures. Um, this is... Uh, uh, a graphic from a uh, share with me from uh, Remy Kalir, who um, uh, published under uh, Remy Holden, uh, with a few co-authors there. Uh, and this is what gameful learning is, and this is something I observed in all of these classes, uh, as well as the teachers themselves are gameful teachers. Um, they have this loosery attitude where you accept that you're in this this game with artificial rules. There's uh, identity play. And there is this idea of ignorance, which as Remy explained to me, or I'm, I'm, I always pronounce his first name wrong, sorry, <laughs> uh, is uh, ignorance. And not ignorance in it's like, you know, fake news error that we're in, but ignorance that you don't know what's going to happen. When you play a, a board game, you don't know what the outcome is, right? Uh, and, and that's how this is. That's what makes it fun and exciting. You don't really know where you're going. You go where the game takes you, as Zach Gilbert tells me. Um, as he told me. And they also use a Montessorian approach. Uh, you know, here's the game. This is why we're playing the game. This is, these are the people that made this game. This game is completely awesome. You're going to love this game. And there it is. I'm not going to tell you anything about it. You have to figure it out on your own. And don't help one another. I need you to figure this out on your own. It's very Montessorian. Uh, also giving a brevity of uh, directions is very Montessorian. And letting somebody figure it out is Montessorian. And guess what? It's also a part of the growth mindset. Great job figuring that out on your own. And uh, again, they use games as drivers of experiential learning. Games are like field trips. Um, 
running a little short on time, so I just want to uh, go a little faster here. Uh, some other games to use in classrooms, like 1979 Revolution, which puts students in the Iranian Revolution, where you make difficult choices. Uh, this War of Mine, which is a game that is set in a, a fictional country in Europe in the 1990s. Uh, this is a game that Tobias and Alex used to teach about uh, ethical decision making, like do you steal bread or don't steal bread. Uh, this is a game that I use in my classroom. I observe Peggy use it in her classroom. Uh, I use this in, uh, in the fall of this past year to teach about the Electoral College and students then design their own 20% time projects based on using this book as, as the central text. And um, Walden is a terrific game from Tracy Fullerton and her studio at USC, uh, which I had been playing. I just started playing the beta version of it. In this game, you play as Henry David Thoreau, and you are in Walden Pond, and you're experiencing Walden Pond. And what a great way to do that when you're teaching the book Walden Pond to actually do that. That's the next best thing than to piling into a school bus and driving hours to upstate, um, you know, Massachusetts to do that. Uh, Democracy Three is a, a game that Alex Husoy uses in Norway to teach, you know, cause and effect of choices made by politicians. And uh, there are many, many games that are drivers of experience. This is um, That Dragging Cancer, which is another one, where you, you, know, you experience um, a tragedy in a family, and um, it's a very deep experience, uh, and there's a lot of content here to talk about with students. And uh, here's students in my classroom playing Pandemic, so you know, board games as well. So I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, go to the last slide here because of time constraints. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> it's almost done. Oh, I should leave it with this part. Students um, in all of these classes also use and embrace the principles of connected learning, which is uh, part of digital media learning. In particular, peer-supported, interest-driven learning. Um, they publish and create games, they play games, they share online in their own communities. And students reflect on action. They don't, teachers are not relying on dashboards, uh, they are relying on their self-created assessments, which are open-ended, like these. And these are some of the answers students give. Uh, so basically what you're doing is you're creating this system of internship for students, where students are learning. Uh, I saw so in my uh, book, I also, uh, upcoming book, I speak with um, David Schaefer, who's an expert of epistemic games, and he even has this platform where you can create these virtual internships, which are sort of like simulation games, where, uh, you know, you get this um, meaningful role play of what it's like to, to work at a job while in the safety of school. And this concept of using games as experiences has really begun to scale, as you can see from the interest that UNESCO has taken of late. And uh, finally, there are some Twitter communities. There's a Twitter chat that starts in, uh, at 8 o'clock tonight. There's the Explore Like a Pirate chat. There's the Minecraft EDU chat. And these are great forums for teachers to get together and share what works in their game-based classroom. And um, this is just some ways you can adapt game-like learning principles into the classroom. And uh, I'll leave it with that. Okay, so I am uh, no longer in full screen mode. And um, thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, yes, Steve, you still need to play <laughs> Walden. Um, the good, the, the uh, interesting thing here is that I'm just now reading all of the um, questions on the side, and there are so many. 
<laughs> so are there any other questions? <laughs> yes, the tribe dinner is great. <laughs> um, actually, the speaker's dinner is a whole separate subhead in the book um, because uh, uh, that's something everybody mentions. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those moments where, you know, you get to like decompress, you're away from, 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 uh, you know, from it all. And, you know, you get to like, uh, it's social, right? You know, that's part of social practice, the social part of it. Other questions? Did I miss anything? It is all about the tribe. Yeah. That, that is, uh, I, I would have to say that one of the most exciting things about adapting my dissertation into a book is reading uh, Jim G's forward, where he's writing about us. <laughs> I don't know why, but that just seems like just amazing, like, you know, <laughs> describing how we all found each other and how, how this is the tribe. Um, you know, that that was, uh, well, <laughs> thanks, Jackie. <laughs> but just all of us together, you know, um, not just me as a writer, but just, you know, the fact that, that this is, uh, you know, when you write a dissertation, it's one of those things you don't realize until you're done with it, that I thought I was writing to describe just how teachers use games in a classroom. And I discovered that teachers don't just use games in a classroom. It's part of a whole larger framework of being social and sharing with each other. And, um, you know, um, the tribe, you, you couldn't divorce the two. You can't just put a game in front of kids and take the assessment and then move on. It is certainly uh, something where it's social. And that's the great thing about conferences. Uh, yes, Serious Play is a terrific conference for this sort of thing. There are many social activities. There are many, um, many, many ideas that are shared. And What's great about conferences like uh, Games and Ed and Serious Play is actually that there's built-in downtime where you can talk to the, the people that lead the sessions in between and you know you exchange business cards and um, it's, it's so vital to attend these types of conferences. And yes, we are always ready, as Peg wrote, to welcome new members into the tribe. Um, that is quite interesting as I was putting this together that a lot of the teachers that I mentioned, like Glenn Irvin, uh, the Spanish teacher who uses Minecraft, or Mark Rundle, they're fairly new to game-based learning. And uh, looking at community of practice theory, they moved from, from lurker to expert. They really moved from the, uh, the outside to the inside of the community. And uh, we are all in progress, correct. There is nothing elitist at all, you're right. Um, th that, that is something I've, uh, I've also observed that free sharing uh, and even sharing of what doesn't work. Because <laughs> not everything is magic, <laughs> especially when you try something new. And there are always new games, which is always exciting. Any other questions? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I'd have to say the thing I stole the most liberally from Peggy is the ethos of her classroom. <laughs> this the spirit of uh, the spirit of uh, of the classroom. Which is, uh, which is nice, kids love it. But uh, for the amount of times that kids come in and say, you know, oh, it's 20% time day. So many of them say, why can't this be 100% time? Uh, in this last marking period, because I teach history, I, I created a 20% time called geeking out in US history. Because for years, kids come up to me and they say, what are we gonna learn about World War II? 
or this year it's what are we going to learn about World War One because Battlefield One video game, and it's not taught until sophomore or junior year in high school in New Jersey. So what do I say? What am I going to say? Oh, you'll get to it in four years. <laughs> you know. So this year what I did was I created a Google spreadsheet, a, a Google form, and I said to the students, okay you tell me what you want to learn about that you won't learn about until high school, anything after the Civil War. And uh, here are the standards in New Jersey. You pick the standards and you, you make it work. And they created this Google form and they all did that. And, and they really want to do that. Because I remember when I went to school, I would go to the back of the history book and say, oh, there's, you know, Watergate. We're never going to get to Watergate, right? So kind of um, deconstructed the class. Well, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you very much again, everybody.